Amen. So keep your place in 2 Chronicles chapter 26. We'll get there in a minute. So we're continuing the personalities uh, sermon series this evening. So once again, uh, most of you have gone to the personalities, uh, 16 personalities website and taken the test to find out uh, what kind of personality you are. And we're just doing some kind of some fun, light sermons on um, these different personalities. And this is by no means an exhaustive study of all these different personalities. I've just chosen a few of these personalities and I'm trying to bunch them up a little bit so um, we can go over the ones that apply to us or the ones that apply to the people of the church. And this evening I want to talk about um, adventurers and virtuosos. We're going to kind of put these two together. So I'm not going to have you raise your hand. Um, I don't even know who all the adventurers and virtuosos in the church are. I know there's several um, of them. So we're going to talk about them together. I want you to look down at 2 Chronicles chapter 26. What I'm trying to do is, in my opinion, pick out somebody in the Bible that fits um, this personality type. And adventurers and virtuosos, we're going to first look at the combined strengths of adventurers and virtuosos. So adventurers and virtuosos are, first of all, the reason I chose 2 Chronicles chapter 26 is because they're creative and imaginative. And if you look down at 2 Chronicles chapter 26, it ta the Bible here is talking about Uzziah, who kind of is one of my favorite kings in the Bible because of some of the things that he did, you know, before the whole pride and leprosy thing happened. But he was a pretty good king and he was, he was doing some pretty creative and imaginative things. And plus, he was a rancher. He was a, he was a husbandman. So I, I kind of like Uzziah. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 26 and verse number 9. And the Bible kind of gives us some insight. And, you know, you don't hear these types of details from every king in the Bible. But Uzziah was doing some things that were above and beyond in this area. And look what he was doing in verse number 9. Moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate and at the valley gate and at the turning of the wall and fortified them. He also built towers in the desert and digged many wells, for he had much cattle, both in the low country and in the plains, husbandmen also, and vine dressers in the mountains, and in Carmel, or Carmel, I guess, <laughs> Carmel, for he loved husbandry. And now, look, if you've ever raised animals, that, that you'll realize that, that part at the end after the colon there where it says for he loved husbandry is very important because if you're going to make your living or you're going to have animals or raise animals you have to love doing it because you're just it there's just if I would have taken my time uh, you know into account on the farm and raising the animals I probably would have made about 10 cents an hour if I would have looked at the time that I spent um, raising livestock. So you have to love it. You have to love husbandry. So it's important um, that that's in there because it shows that the Bible understands that in order to be someone who raises livestock, you have to love uh, doing it. Okay, now look um, down at verse number 11. Moreover, so first of all, verse number 9, he's building these towers. He's building, he's fortifying the towers. He's building, um, you know, all these different, he, look, he, this guy's building infrastructure. Here, he's building infrastructure. Verse 11, Moreover, Uzziah had an host of fighting men that went out to war by bands according to the number of their account by the hand of Jeel the scribe and Masai, Maseah the ruler under the hand of Hananiah, one of the king's captains. The whole number of the chief of the fathers of the mighty men of valor were 2,600. And under their hand was an army, 300,000 and 7,500 that made war with mighty power to help the king against the enemy. So he's fortifying himself. He's building infrastructure. He's building, um, he's building um, an army. Look at verse 14. And Uzziah prepared for them throughout all the hosts of shields and spears and helmets and habergeons and bows and slings to cast stones. And he made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men to be on the towers upon the bulwarks to shoot arrows and great stones withal. And his name spread far abroad, for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. It basically it's saying, look, he was just, he, he was building all these cool things, these engines, these engines being catapults and slings 
and you know trebuchets or whatever they were to throw these stones and throw these slings to cast stones. He's, he's building an army, he's fortifying an empire, and this is a man who's got some creative and imaginative drive within him. So this is who I chose for the adventures and probably more virtuoso in uh, Uzziah's case. But let's just, let me just read off for you some of the strengths for the virtuosos and the adventurers, and then I'll we'll choose. A, I chose a couple of them, um, a couple of combined strengths that they both share, and then a couple of combined uh, weaknesses that they both share. And then we'll shine the light of the Bible on it and see if they're weaknesses or strength, or maybe a little bit of both. So first, virtuosos. They're optimistic and energetic. They're creative and practical. Once again, uh, talking about Uzziah. They're spontaneous and rational. They know how to prioritize. They're great in a crisis. We'll talk about that at the end of the sermon. And they're very relaxed people. The strengths of the adventurers, according to the secular study, is they're charming. They are sensitive to others. They're imaginative. Again, they share that with the virtuosos. They're passionate. They're curious. They have a lot of ideas. And they are artistic. So adventurers are able to show their creativity in tangible, artistic ways. So first of all, I want to look at some combined strengths of both of these personality types. And the first thing I want to point out about both of them together, and I haven't mentioned this a lot with the previous sermons, but both of these personality types are considered introverts. They're considered introverts. So what does that mean? Let me give you the, the secular definition. It's really a secular term, but it's this. And introverts is, of course, the opposite of being an extrovert. Okay? So the traits of extroversion and introversion are a central dimension in some human personality theories. The terms introversion and extroversion were introduced in psychology by Carl Jung, although both the popular understanding and current Physiological usage vary. Extroversion tends to be manifested in an outgoing, talkative behavior, whereas introversion is manifested in a more reflective, quiet, and reserved behavior. So here you have, you know, I'm sure you've, you've heard of it before, but extroverts, they're people that they like being around groups of people. And they like talking, and they're always talking, and they're very, like, they want to be in groups talking all the time, okay? And, you know, look, some of you are laughing. I'm not, I'm not looking at any particular person here, okay? But some people are extroverts. They love this environment. Other people, that terrifies. Other people, you know, would just rather be not in groups of people. And I think that those were some of the questions, if I remember, of the personality test was, you know, a lot of do you like being in groups or not kind of thing. But introverts would rather, they're, they're quiet, they're reserved. They're going to be the one that's, if they're in a group, they're going to be one that's not saying much. Okay, they're going to be one that's not saying much. Now turn to Proverbs 17. In my opinion, the Bible tends to favor the introvert a little bit as far as you know the type of you know character traits that you have and I'll tell you I'll explain to you why okay look at Proverbs chapter 17 and look at verse number 28 so remember you have the extrovert they like being in big groups of people and they like being the one talking they thrive on environments like that and then you have the introvert which the virtuoso and the adventurer are both introverted they would rather not be in groups, and when they are in groups, they, they are quiet, they're reserved, and they don't say much. Okay? Look at Proverbs 17, 28. The Bible says this, Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise, and he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. Look, this says that if you're quiet and you're not just blabbing all the time, that you could be a fool and people could still think that you're a man of understanding. It's when you open your mouth, you know, I mean, have you heard that it's better to be a silent fool than to open your mouth and to remove all doubt? I mean, that is, you know, basically what Proverbs 17, 28 is saying, is that if you talk all the time, there's a good chance, and you know, if you're one of these people that just talks all the time, you speak a lot, you speak over people a lot, you know, other people can't get a word in edgewise, there's a good chance you're going to prove yourself to be a fool in those cases. So this is where the advantage is to the 
intro, or into the, it, it, the advantage is to the introvert. Well, turn to Proverbs chapter 21. Proverbs chapter 21. Your mouth, your mouth can actually get you in a lot of trouble. This is another advantage introvert right here. Because your tongue, the Bible says, can cause you a lot of problems in your life. Proverbs 21, look at verse 23. And the Bible says, whoso, that means whosoever, keepeth his mouth and his tongue, keepeth his soul from troubles. So you say, you know, I'm, I'm not an introvert. I like being uh, in groups and I like to talk all the time. Well, there's a good chance you're going to get yourself in trouble if that's the case. You know, so you're like, I, but I like to be the one telling people how it is all the time. Well, there's a good chance, you know, you're going to get yourself in trouble. Look, you should try to change that. Your tongue can actually do you a lot of harm in your life. Turn to Proverbs chapter 18. The Bi I mean, the Bible actually has a lot to say about your tongue. We're not going to spend a ton of time on it, uh, but, you know, the Bible does say that, I mean, look, if you're, if you're introverted, you're safer according to, you know, what the Bible says about your tongue. Look at Proverbs 18, 21. I mean, look at this. Look at the, I mean, look at the wording here. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Look, I mean, learn to control your tongue is what the Bible is saying. Learn to control your tongue. You're like, I'm an extrovert. I love to talk. I love to be around groups of people. Learn to control your tongue. Learn to control what you say. You, you like to be along gr among groups of people? Great. Learn to listen. Learn to be, you know, quieter. Speak less. Learn from, that doesn't mean you have to become an introvert, but learn some things from them. Learn this advantage from them. Now, so you say, okay, introverts, we're all supposed to just be reserved and never say anything and just be these people that never want to be in groups of people or never want to talk. Well, introversion can also be a disadvantage. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Being shy. Being shy, not wanting to speak, not wanting to talk. You know, it's, look, it's not a bad thing, like we said, when it comes to controlling your tongue, when it comes to, you know, keep you from trouble. Like, whenever, uh, just a good rule of thumb, I've said this before, is whenever you're not sure what to say, maybe you don't know what the answer is, and, you know, you're not sure what people are talking about, it's best to just be silent. It's best to just say nothing. I mean, if you think, I mean, the person that wants to be the first one to answer a question all the time, he's the one that's going to be shown to be a fool. Maybe not that first one. Maybe he gets lucky on the first two or three answers, but eventually he's going to be sh shown to be a fool. So let's look at Paul for a minute. Let's look at Paul. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. How could being shy be a bad thing? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and look at verse number 1. You say, Paul, here's the greatest evangelist that's ever lived on the earth to date. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how good of a soul winner you are, but you know, you weren't as good as Paul. Okay? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. And I, brethren, Paul, the greatest, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. A lot of people have told me that they thought that Paul was maybe a commander. I don't think Paul was a commander. He was way too humble. I mean, Paul was way too humble. And actually here, he was saying, he's like, look, He's like, I'm not even good at speaking. He's like, I'm not even good at speaking. I'm not even that smart. <laughs> I mean, he's saying, you know, I, I came to you and I don't, I don't speak well and I'm not the smartest, you know, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed is basically what he's saying. But I came declaring to you, he's saying, it didn't matter that I couldn't speak well and it didn't matter that I'm not the smartest person you've ever met because I'm not declaring my own testimony. I'm declaring the testimony of God is what he's saying. Now look at Romans chapter 1. So Paul, I mean, he knew that he wasn't the most, you know, just well-versed person in the world. He knew that he wasn't the smartest person out there, but look at his life. Look what he produced. Now turn to Romans chapter 1. So him knowing this, him knowing this, I mean, that could have caused Paul to be like, you know what? Uh, you know, he could have just been really self-conscious about that. He could have just been really, you know, this was Moses. When he went to God, I am not an eloquent man. He was nervous. He's like, find somebody else. He's like, I can't speak well. Why would you put me in front of Pharaoh? He's like, I, why would you do that? I'm not eloquent. 
But look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 15. This is how Paul handled it. So Paul knew that he wasn't an eloquent man, just like Moses. And this is what Paul did. Look at verse 15. So, as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also, that are at Rome also. Why? Why? Why is he so ready to go to all these new places and preach the gospel? Be, I mean, he's not smart. He's not, you know, it's not that he thought he was dumb. It's just that he wasn't, you know, the wisest person. He knew that, you know, he wasn't eloquent. Because, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also the Greek. Because he's not ashamed of the gospel because it's God's power, not his. It's God's power that we're carrying out to Fresno every single week, not ours. It's not, it's not us. It's not my wisdom. It doesn't matter how smart I am to go preach the gospel because it's God's wisdom. It doesn't matter how well versed I am because it's not my words. It's not my words. I don't have to be a good speaker. I don't have to be eloquent. I don't have to come up with all these beautiful flowing words. They're already here. And it's not our power. It's not our message. It's, we're just can't, I mean, what's the word? Ambassadors. We're ambassadors of another message. And it's God's message. It's God's power. So Paul may not have been a great speaker. He may not as Moses. Moses was worried about the same thing. He, he may not have been an eloquent man. Yet as much as was in him, he was not going to be shy about it. He proclaimed the message. So, I mean, I can't tell you. I mean, I can't tell you personally how many super quiet, introverted people I know that are awesome soul winners. I mean, they're great soul winners to the point where when you know them personally and you know how quiet they are and then you go out soul winning with them, you're just like... You go out soul winning with them for the first time, knowing who they are and how in introverted they are, and then you go soul winning with them. I'm sure people like uh, you all know people that I'm talking about. You can think about these people. And you're just like, they're just amazing soul winners. I mean, Paul is the greatest evangelist, you know, ever. So you ought not let that stop you from proclaiming the word of God, is the point I'm trying to make. So if you're introverted and it is stopping you from proclaiming the word of God, you know, that's a disadvantage. That's a serious disadvantage. So, they're introverted. We see that can be a good thing when it comes to controlling our tongue and keeping us out of trouble. And it can be a bad thing if it's keeping us from, you know, proclaiming the gospel to a lost and dying world. The second thing. The second thing that virtuosos and adventurers have in common is what I began the sermon off with. They are creative and imaginative. Now look. This is a serious advantage in life. If you are creative and imaginative, that, this is an advantage. And you say, why? Because, because we're living in a time especially when practically nobody is. We're living in a time... Look, everyone, I'm telling you, everyone is in the box. Everyone's in the box. Everyone, and, and it's because... And it's because, and you see it out soul winning, it's because they're all hypnotized. They're hypnotized by TV. They're hypnotized by pop culture. And they're just, they're just going along with everyone else on everything. I mean, you think to yourself, you think to yourself, why in the world would you do something? I mean, think about this. Why would you do something just because that's what everybody else does? Yet, that's what everyone's doing. They're just doing that. They, they've removed, people have removed rational thought from their lives. And they're just going along with what everybody else is doing. There's so many examples of this. I can't even list them all. Here, I saw this one again today, soul winning. Wearing a mask by yourself driving in your car. <laughs> what in the world? You know? Okay, you buy it into the mass thing, that's fine, that's your business, you want to do that. But you're so, I mean, you're so irrational at this point, and you're just, you're just like following everything that anyone ever tells you that you're, you're scared of your own self. I don't even, under, you can't even circular logic that one. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. You know, moral change, just accepting everything. 
just because everybody else accepts it, no matter what. I mean, public school, because everybody else does it. You don't like it, but everybody else does it, so then we have to do it now. You know, it's, I mean, the, look, the zombie apocalypse is here. We're living it. I mean, thank God for the Bible. It doesn't matter what everybody else does, what everybody else follows. I mean, this is our guide. That's it. And even as far as creativity goes, that's all dying too. It's all dying. It's going along with, with as the status quo just sinks lower and lower and lower, creativity is almost dead. But Uzziah, turn to Proverbs 29. Uzziah built engines and towers and wells and weapons. I mean, the man, the man was creative. He was imaginative. The man had a vision. The man had a vision. Look at Proverbs 29. Look at Proverbs 29, 18. He had a plan. The Bible says in Proverbs 29 18, it says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Look, I mean, the Bible here is talking about being creative and imaginative and having a, vi a leader having a vision on where he wants to go. And I mean, and that makes the difference on whether or not the people that are with him die or not. I mean, that's pretty serious. So he was building this infrastructure, these machines, so much so, look, so much so that the Bible mentions all the things that he was actually building. But, what, but look, just like every other thing, every other advantage that we're talking about in this series, you're like, I'm not an adventurer. I'm not a virtuoso. I could never be creative. Wrong. The point of this sermon series is so you, you, can, all have, you can all have the advantages that we talk about here. Go back to 2 Chronicles 26. How do I know? Let's follow Uzziah's model, and you can be creative and imaginative too. Look at 2 Chronicles 26. You're like, I want to be creative. I want to be creative um, with my family at home. I want to be creative in educating my children. I want to be creative and imaginative, and I want to raise kids that are creative and imaginative. Well, let's, let's look at the model. I want to have ideas at work so I can maybe get some better skills and I can get in some better places so I can improve my family and, and better support my family. Look at 2 Chronicles 26. We can be creative and imaginative. I'm not either one of these things. Here's what we need to do. 16 years old. Look at verse number 3. 16 years old was Uzziah when he began to reign. I mean, you're pretty hard on Uzziah. You know, the whole, like, you know deciding to be a priest on, him, you know, on his own and the leprosy thing. Not a great ending. I get it. But the guy reigned for 52 years. I mean, that's a long time. Go study the kings. You know, there's a lot of four years. There's a lot of six years. There's a lot of seven years. There's some one years. There's some less than a year. I mean, but there's not a lot of... I mean, David was 40 years. Solomon was 40 years. This guy reigned for 52 years. His mother's name was also Jechaliah of Jerusalem, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah did. And verse number 5, what did he do? So he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Look, lots of the kings, they, you know, the, the kings will start out their history in their life, he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Or he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. There's not that many that did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. However, this was a little bit further. He took a step further here. Look at verse 5. So he did that was, was right in the sight of the Lord. He did what his father did. So his father, you know, was, was, was doing what was right in the sight of the Lord. And it says, according to all that his father Amaziah did. So he, he did the right things that Amaziah did, is what the Bible is saying. But then he went further. The Bible says in verse number 5, and he sought God. He sought God in the days of Zechariah who had the understanding and the visions of God. Look, this guy, so here's, I'm going to give you a two-step plan. Here's a two-step plan to become creative and imaginative in your life. Because look, any ideas you have, any ideas Uzziah had, any visions that he had that were good, that were good for his kingdom, good for his people, look, they didn't come from him. I know it. They came, I mean, there's a reason the Bible gives us the pretext to what Uzziah did. From his army to his infrastructure to all his machines and engines and all these cool things. Look, the, the reason that that happened is because of verses number 3 through 5. He sought the Lord. So step one in becoming creative and imaginative is seek the Lord. Seek the Lord in your life. Look, 
do what you're supposed to do in your life. Sell out for the Lord in your life. This is just step one. If you can't do this part, you're never going to make step two. So sell out for the Lord. Work hard at everything you do, gaining knowledge, especially of things of the Lord along the way. That's step one. Okay? Now here's a good one. Here's what you do. What did he do in verse 5? He sought the Lord. Here's what you do. You, you sell out for the Lord in your life, and then here's what you do. You pray for creativity. You pray for God to give you a vision. Not a vision like, you know, of, of, of you know, unicorns. I'm talking about a, a, a path. Creativity. You know, something that, you know, you need, you know, that imaginative ability, the creativity that you need to lead your family, to do well at your job. Look, that's a prayer that God's going to answer. You do that. You seek the Lord. You sell out for the Lord. You seek the Lord. You, you just, just get in this thing. And then pray for creativity and call me in six months and let me know how that's going. It'll work. It'll work. We can all have, I mean, look, we can all have these creative tendencies that virtuosos and adventurers have. I mean, just follow King Uzziah's example. Seek the Lord. Follow the Lord. Seek the Lord. Pray. You know, pray for these things. So those are some advantages. Let's look at some weaknesses. There are some combined weaknesses that they both share as well. And the, the, let me just read for you the, the secular weaknesses that I'm going to put together here. Adventurers are unpredictable. Virtuosos dislike commitment. They have risky behavior and they're easily bored. So these two things I'm going to combine into one package called they're, you know, they're instable. They're, they're not stable. They're unstable. Turn to James chapter 1. The Bible would call this instability. James chapter 1. Instability is one of these disadvantages that has the ability to cancel out all your advantages. If you're unstable, it doesn't really matter how advantaged you are in other places. Because this one thing can cancel the, all of that out. So it's pretty serious. Look at James chapter 1, verse 8. The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. I've preached an entire sermon on just being unstable. It's bad. You don't want to be unstable in your life. Look, this one thing, it stops people from serving the Lord. It stops people. I mean, think about the fact that if you're unstable, it, it'll stop you from serving the Lord in your life. It'll stop you from doing those things that you should be doing in your life because you'll never be able to be consistent. You'll drop out of everything. I mean, look, it, it'll be bad in your secular life. You'll drop out of things. You'll stop things. You'll quit things at home. You'll, you'll not be stable. You'll not have a good routine for your children. You'll not be able to you know, properly implement biblical you know, child-rearing uh, techniques with your family. I mean, it's a disaster. If you're unstable, I mean, you'll lose jobs. You'll move from job to job to job. Look, somebody that can't hold down a job is unstable. And they're double-minded. There's a major problem there. There's a major problem if you have somebody that, you know, has, has had eight jobs in, in a year or two. I mean, that's a problem. There's something going on there. Look, we've all had a bad job. And okay, I just can't work here, whatever. But that doesn't happen eight times in a row. Okay, there's trends that pop up. But for, the first thing is this. Remember the two-step plan? If you're unstable, you will never be stable in seeking the Lord. So if you're unstable, you'll never be stable in your Christian life, and you've, you've already lost on step one of, of the plan. And it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to ruin so many things for you, even in your Christian life, especially in your spiritual life. I mean, and look, you'll never get good at anything if you can't s stick to anything. I mean, somebody told me one time that it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert at anything. That, and that's, that's pretty true. 10,000 hours to become an expert at something. And it doesn't matter what that something is. Soul winning, plumbing, electrical work, whatever. 10,000 hours, that's how long it takes to become an expert. So look, 
being unstable will, will ruin all these things. So that is something that has to change if that's a tendency that you have. I mean, you say, well, you know, I just don't, you know, I get into something and I just don't like it. Well, the difference, the difference between somebody who's stable and somebody who's unstable is not the fact that they like everything all the time. It's not that the person who's stable just likes everything and never has a bad time. It's, it's that when the stable person hits a moment in their life, whether it be their spiritual life or their work life or their home life, and things go bad, they don't stop. They don't quit. They keep going. They, they, they go through that hard time until they get out of the valley and start coming up the hill once again. The unstable person, they say, well, it's bad. I, I don't like it. I'm going I'm to do something different. They're double-minded. Everything's always a question. That's what double-minded means. It means everything, they're walking through their life. I actually feel bad for them. If you're a double-minded person, I actually kind of feel sorry for you. Because if you're double-minded, it means that you're walking through life and everything's a question. Should I, should I go or should I not go? Should I stay or should I not? Should I uh, get up or should I not? Everything's, I mean, it must be so confusing. Whereas a stable person just does what they do no matter what comes at them. That, that's why it's so important to be stable and not to be unstable or double-minded. Now look, if you become, if you just decide, I'm not going to be double-minded, this is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to do it no matter what, and I'm going to continue doing it no matter what, and I mean, look, that's how you have to look at your Christian life. It's not going to be, it's not going to be all happy, you know, and flowers all the time. There's going to be bad times. There's going to be valleys in your life and everything. You just have to make the decision that you're always going to keep going. Otherwise, you know, you're going to become an unstable person and, and everything else goes out the window. What's the second one? The second one, turn to John chapter 14. They both, they both share this idea and I'm calling this a disadvantage, but they both, adventurers and virtuosos, both share this idea that they're big into freedom of expression. And, you know, stubbornness and inability, you know, stubbornness, inability to adhere to rules, you know, I mean, they both share this characteristic. That's not a good thing in the Christian life. Because look, this is kind of like a book of rules. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's, there's a reason they call it the law. You know, the law. The gospel's in here, but the law's in here too. Okay, so look, turn to John 14, 15. I'm sure you all have it memorized. If you love me, keep my commandments. Stubbornness and inability to follow rules is not going to go well with John 14, 15. Look, expressing yourself and going your own way, this is secular garbage. This is secular garbage that will ruin your life. This is secular garbage that's being taught to the upcoming generations. Go your own way. Find yourself. All this stuff. No. Go this way is what we're trying to teach here. Go the Bible way. We need to go the Bible way. It's the only way that will actually lead us to where we need to be. So, we see that there's some advantages that they both share. There's some disadvantages that they both share. But there's one point that I wanted to bring up where they both differ. That's a very interesting um, little study here. But the virtuoso is calm and collected, they call it. And then the adventurer is easily, on the opposite of this, is easily panicked and stressed out. Okay, so now, look, there's ups and downs to each one of these. They're, they're to, the virtuoso and the adventurer are together on a lot of things, but they differ on this one thing. The virtuoso, I'm going to say it again, is calm and collected. You're like, how could that ever be bad? And then the adventurer is easily panicked. They get hyped up quickly, stressed out quickly. But look, how could being calm and collected ever be a disadvantage? Let me start with this one. Well, I mean, some situations call for alarm. I mean, when a house is on fire, I mean, that, you know, that, that causes, that's cause for alarm, literally, right? That's why we have fire alarms, all right? So you ever met a person where things were just crazy and there was action needed and, and you just, you, they just never got excited about anything? You ever met that person? You just couldn't light a fire under them for anything. I mean, this is that, this is that guy at work 
where you just, you just can't get him to care about anything. You know, he's just calm and collected about everything all the time. And you're like, man, we're all going to get fired. Are you going to get excited and do something? You know? And look, this is, the, this, is the, uh, this is the teenager today. This is the teenager today. I mean, they just, what in the world? It, it's, it's like they're not all there. It's like they're not all there. You know, not, look, not you teenagers. But I'm just saying, these are the teenagers we knock on their door. And they're just like... Oh, I don't think they're on drugs either. That's, you know, if they were on drugs, at least there's an explanation. But it's just, it, it's, they're different. They're different, and I've seen it change in the last 10 years. They're just like, yeah, you know, uh, you know. Uh, uh. They're, 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 they just don't care. They just don't get excited. Hey, you, you know, you're like, you're going to go to hell and burn forever. And they're like, yeah, um, you know, yeah. You know, they don't care. You can't get them. They just don't care about much at all. They're too calm. They're too calm. You know, you can't get them excited. I mean, you see it especially out soul winning with the younger generation. It, you know, but look. So we see that, you know, there's some things like, you know what? Uh, where's my soul going to go for eternity? Those things should get us you know, should get you excited. If you're a thinking person, that should get you to the point where you're like, um, I don't know where my soul is going to go for eternity. What are the options? Heaven, sounds pretty good. Hell, ooh, that's not good. Want to make sure I'm not going to that one. That would be the rational thought there. But it just, there's not that care anymore. There's not that care. It's not, like, like I said, they've been hypnotized. They've been hypnotized. They've been, they've been you know, they've been literally hypnotized. I mean, don't tell me that all these screens and these constant devices in your face constantly are not changing people. It is changing people. We are watching it happen today. But what's the other side of this? The other side of just being calm and you can never get excited about anything is just this person that's just panicking all the time. You know, that's the opposite. So, I mean, the, virtuo you know, the virtuoso can think through a crisis, they say, and, you know, that's an advantage in life, not getting panicked in that situation. But, you know, panicking is never really good. So let's think about this. Where's the balance? Turn to Philippians chapter 4. Where's the balance? Say something. Let's talk about handling stress. Where's the balance between complete calmness all the time and just hair on fire panic all the time? Where's the balance? Well, I'm glad the Bible, you know, tells us everything. Look at Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 6. You know, I mean, you say, you know, I've got a problem. I've got problems. I don't know whether just to be calm about it or to panic. Look at Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 6. The Bible says, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. So, I mean, first of all, the Bible here is saying, you know, basically, don't stress yourself out over things. It's saying, you know, don't be so careful. It's saying, don't be so careful for things, but in everything instead, ask God. It's saying in everything, just in prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, come to God with respect, let your requests be made known unto God. So look, don't forget, don't forget to pray about your problems. Don't forget to pray about your problems. And then, don't make quick decisions in times of crisis. I mean, an otherwise person once told me, some, some old guy that I grew up around said basically never make a decision when, you know, right after something bad's happened and you're stressed out. That's pretty good advice. Instead, you know, you should just go, you should calm down, you should say, you say something just happens. You know, instead of making that knee-jerk decision, just calm down and pray. Just calm down and just bring it, stop and bring it to the Lord in prayer. And then, you know, then identify solutions and, and, and God will lead you down this road. Identify solutions, and this is where I do thought experiments with solutions. I, I mean, I identify three solutions to a problem and then just, just think through it. Just like, what happens if I take option one? What, what are the possibilities of things that could happen? What if I take option two? What are those possibilities of things 
that could happen. What about option three? What are those possible? And you know what? It'll be pretty clear, especially if you know the Bible and you've, you've stopped and you've prayed. Um, it'll be pretty clear on what you should do in those situations. Don't just panic and make knee-jerk decisions. And then, of course, take action on these things. Take action. Look, do something about it. I mean, problems just, many problems are going to require your action to, you know, to, to solve them. Once you identify, you've prayed, you've identified the solution you want to take, then you take that action. So, virtuosos and adventurers. Look, I'm not, I'm not either of these. But once again, you know, once again we see that while they have certain tendencies, and I just want to reiterate this again, the virtuoso and the adventurer, they have certain tendencies, they have, they have some advantages. And you say, I'm not either of these and I want to be creative. Well, you can be. You can be creative and they have some disadvantages, but look, by seeking the Lord, by following His will and not ours, we don't have to be a slave to these, these certain traits that were, you know, these boxes that were put in um, by these studies. So we can have numerous advantages and you know, we may not have secular, we can have advantages that we may not have that, that tendency towards according to this study. You know, you can still be creative. I mean, why in the world, just answer me this question. Look, I've, I've done this and it works. Okay, I've had some pretty cool ideas, you know, throughout my career. I don't know where they came from. I'm telling you, I had, I had an idea, let me just, let me just, I had an idea and it became a patent for this company. It's, it's a full-blown patent. This company's made millions of dollars. I made a dollar. <laughs> but look, and, and it was a problem that we had at one of, the, one of the plants that I was at. And you know what? You know where I thought of the solution? I was, I was putting a fence post in with Garrett. I can still remember the exact place I was. I was putting a fence post in. in, in I was digging a hole in the ground. Literally digging in the dirt, and it just came to me. Look, that wasn't from me. But I, 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 was, I pray for solutions. I pray for creativity. I don't know where that came from. I'm not the smartest guy in the room, just like Paul. I mean, but look, God can give you creativity. God can give you whatever solutions to whatever problems that you have in your life. All you have to do is seek Him and pray for it. You don't have to be a virtuoso. You don't have to be, you know, on some chart, on some internet test that you took. You can be as creative as... You want to be, just seek the Lord and just ask God for creativity. Why would God not help you be creative? Why would God not, you're like, I want to work really hard and I want to support my family because the Bible says that I should do that. And you pray, God, let me work hard and help me do this. And then you actually do it. And then you pray for creativity. Why in the world would God not answer that prayer? I mean, why would he give, I mean, why would he give a rock, you know, instead of, you know, a, a loaf of bread? I mean, God's a better father than you. These are prayers that are going to be answered. And we have to look at prayers. I mean, take advantage. Look, take advantage of these prayers in your life that you know will be answered in a positive way. God, give me a billion dollars. Probably not going to do that for your own protection. But God, help me do what the Bible says. Probably going to, probably going to answer that one. Right? So we can have these advantages no matter what category we're talking about. Thank God for the Bible. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.